Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Have your Bible turn over to Joshua 24. And uh, my goal today is I hope the study's been a blessing to you. I do want to wrap up Joshua, the book of Joshua today. Uh, the first thing I want to show you, just uh, quickly, is a, a contradiction in your King James Bible, or what someone would call a contradiction. I want to show you that it's here in chapter 24, so I did want to cover it before I left the book of Joshua. And then I want to review Joshua quickly, and then I will close out the last couple verses. I don't think we've actually covered this last couple verses, 29 through 33. We'll do that this morning, amen? A lot to go over, and um, I'm sure the Lord will help us. Uh, let's just go ahead and say a word of prayer now. Dear Lord, we love you, and thank you, God, for this morning. God, I pray you'd help me, Lord. Uh, God, help your people, Lord, to be attentive, Lord, and to take in the word of God. Uh, maybe it won't all sink into the heart this morning, God. Maybe it will stay up in the head, but Lord, I pray you bring it down to the heart throughout the week or bring it back to their memory. Uh, whenever they need it, God, I ask and pray in Jesus Christ's name, and amen. Amen. Uh, I want to show you a contradiction here, what people could call a contradiction. And uh, I want to show you how someone comes to, to find a contradiction in your Bible. And then I want to show you the purpose is to build up your faith in your Bible. Uh, people try to come up with contradictions in your Bible all the time. Obviously, they're not uh, true contradictions. Uh, the key to remember is this. Uh, you can correct any error or contradiction in your Bible with the Bible. And if someone ever brings something to you that you can't explain or you don't know the answer to, and they say, well, why does it say this over here but not this over there? Just tell them to say, I don't, to be honest, I don't understand the answer right now, but if you give me time, I'd be more than happy to look it up for you and get back with you on it. I mean, there, there's an answer to everything in your Bible uh, as to why something says something. Let me show you this contradiction. And uh, the Bible explains itself. You just have to study it out. Uh, Joshua 24, verse number 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes the elders to Shechem, Call for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwell on the other side of the flood. Notice that. In old time, even Terah, notice that name, the father of Abraham, the father of Nacor, they served other gods. In verse 3, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. Now, uh, if someone wanted to say this was a contradiction, they would say this. Turn over to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. They would say that's an error. Uh, Joshua misspoke or the translators mistranslated those names and that, they're saying it's not accurate. I'll show you why they would say it's not accurate. Um, Joshua said uh, you're, they dwell on the other side of the flood, even Terah, the father of Abraham, uh, on the other side of the flood. Look in uh, Genesis 11, verse number 23. Sarah lived after he begat Nahor, there's Nahor, 200 years and begat sons and daughters. Nahor lived 90, uh, 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. Verse 25, Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years, begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham. There's Abraham, Nahor, and Aaron. So, Aaron, why is this an issue? Genesis 11 is after the flood. Joshua 24 says he brought them over in times where they lived on the other side of the flood. Well, so you could come to your King James Bible and say that's a mistranslation. Those names back in Joshua 24, Terah, uh, uh, Terah, Nahor, Abraham, they didn't live on the other side of the flood. They lived on this side of the flood. Do you know what I mean in genealogy? They would say the flood's already happened. If you, if you view it this way, Adam and Eve, the flood, Noah, Genesis 7, like we're going over on our Wednesday nights, and then Abraham, Terah, and Nahor, they all came after the flood. Well, Joshua said where they lived on the other side of the flood. So you could come to your Bible and say, well, Joshua 24, that's inaccurate. That, that, that's not chronologically correct. That's not historically correct. Well, let me show you how to correct that with your King James Bible. You don't have to go to the Hebrew. You don't have to go to the Greek. You can correct it with your King James Bible. Look over in Genesis chapter number 3, or uh, jo Joshua chapter 3. Turn back to Joshua chapter 3. What happens is you come, a person comes to the Bible with a preconceived idea or a preconceived uh, uh, or a, an assumption about what a word means. And they hear the word flood, and they automatically think of Noah. But it's not talking about Noah's flood. Look in Joshua 3, verse 15. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest. You know what flood Joshua's talking about? He says, when they dwelt on the other side of the flood, talking about the flood of, of River Jordan. When they crossed the River Jordan was overflowing. And he says in times past, where they lived, Abraham, so you have Adam and Eve. You have the flood, Genesis 7. You have Abraham uh, Abraham and his father, Terah and Nahor. You have them showing up there in Genesis chapter 11. And then you have Joshua 3, the crossing of the flood, River Jordan. And Joshua's here in Joshua 24 saying, whenever they lived on the other side of the flood, being the, the flood of Jordan. That's what Joshua's talking about. Let me show you one more place, Psalm 66. 
The Bible is its own uh, dictionary, it's its own definition, it's its own concordance. And there's nothing wrong with using a concordance, Psalm 66, uh, to find where words are at, but uh, the Bible will explain itself. Look in Psalm 66 and verse um, 6. Psalm 66, verse 6. That's not a good number, is it? 66, 6. <laughs> he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. Uh, they went uh, through the flood on foot. Are they talk is he talking about Noah's flood? They didn't go through the flood. If they went through the flood on foot, they died. They didn't go through the flood on foot. foot. The psalmist here is talking about Joshua's flood. The flood doesn't always mean Noah's flood. Do you get what I'm saying? You can come to the Bible and say, well, the flood always means Noah's flood. Well, Joshua 24, that's inaccurate. Those people didn't live at that time. He's wrong with the chrono uh, chronological order of things. Uh, but no, the Bible says that the flood can mean the river overflowing, the flood of the river. Uh, so I just want to show you that, that Joshua wasn't wrong. Joshua wasn't inaccurate. The King James translators were not inaccurate. It, it wasn't an unfortunate rendering, an unfortunate mistranslation. No, and the Bible means what it says. It's just... What, what God does is, you can turn back to Joshua 24, what God does is, he makes it to where if you want to be in a trap and you want to be ensnared by his words, he'll let you do it. If you, if you, don't, want to, if you don't want to study the word of God out, if you want to just believe something that's inaccurate, he'll let you do it. He'll let you get tripped up on his word. This thing is a trap. This thing is a trap. If you come to it and you're not careful with it, it you'll be entrapped by it. Um, so that's why you have to write and divide the word of truth. And uh, I always do this, I, I, I'll be done at this point, but are you coming to something in the Bible that you do not understand? Say, God, I believe that you are right, I believe that you're always right, and say this, I believe by faith your book is perfect. And God, until I figure out what it means, I'll just take it by faith that I'm the one that's in the wrong, I don't understand what it means. You know what I'm saying? That's how you can correct a contradiction yeah. in the Bible. <clears throat> God's book's always right. Now, I want to, put, I want to review Joshua. Um, you don't have to turn anywhere. I'm going to give you an outline of each of the books and things that we went through. We, this is the 53rd lesson. I almost got it all in one year. Amen, Brother Frank. I almost had 52 lessons on this thing. Uh, but it, it was 53, and that bothered me. I wanted to finish it last week. That way I could be right on 52. But anyway, it's 53. This is the 53rd lesson. We're not going to repeat everything we went over at all 53 lessons. But I just want you, a good way to study is to go over whenever a, a Whenever a lecturer gives a presentation, what they do, a lecture on a subject, they give you the first slide will be the objectives. And the objectives are, this is what this lesson's about, this is things in general that we're going to learn. And then after that, you go into a deep dive into each subject, and then at the very end, you do a review of everything that you learned. And that's all I want to give you this morning, is just a review quickly of the book of Joshua, so you have it in your mind, stories that are in here, principles that are in here, and uh, it, it'll stick with you a little better. The overarching theme of Joshua is the abundant Christian life or the victorious Christian life, or conquering Christians, or successful saints. That's the overarching theme of Joshua, is how to be a successful saint of God, how to be a conquering Christian. And this book pairs up uh, greatly with Ephesians. Ephesians is all about battling, it's all about your inheritance, it's all about uh, doing the work of God, and the will of God, and the power, and you have the, the armor, and all those things there in Ephesians 6, it goes hand in hand with Ephesians. Uh, we talked about uh, another another theme you could you say is all throughout the book is that uh, rest is a reward from God. Rest is a reward from God. Uh, whenever you fight the good fight of faith, there is a spiritual rest that takes place in your life. So rest is a reward. Uh, another principle or, or uh, concept throughout the book of Joshua is that failure is not final. Joshua failed several times throughout the book of Joshua. He was not perfect, um, but Joshua kept fighting. He kept fighting. So failure is not fi uh, final. And another concept or theme that you see throughout the book of Joshua is that the Christian life is a battle, not a banquet. The Christian life is a battle, not a banquet. Uh, we're supposed to be out on the front lines, not hanging out at headquarters. Amen. Joshua was out at the front lines in the battle, in the heat of the battle. He was not hanging out, sipping, sipping tea at the, at the headquarters. He was out fighting the battle. And the Christian life is a battle. It's not a banquet just to have fun. Um, chapter 1 of Joshua, we talk about being a successful leader. We talked about good courage. We talked about uh, sandbox saints. Sandbox saints. Those three Transjordan tribes that didn't go all the way. We talked about how they were sandbox saints. They were carnal saints. They were a picture of a carnal Christian not all the way in. We talked about what good courage is. And folks, there is courage. You can have courage to burn down a building in a city. That's not good courage, though. Good courage is doing right, and it takes good courage to live out this Bible, doesn't it? We talk about good courage. We talk about a successful leader. Joshua 2, you have the two spies. We talked about how God sent them. Uh, they're also a picture of the two witnesses in Revelation. 
Uh, they'll come up during the tribulation and have their heads cut off and then raise again from the dead and do signs and miracles and wonders and call off rain. Glory to God. That was all in there. Amen. The two spies. We talked about Rahab's stay at home orders. Amen. She had a quarantine. Rahab, chapter 2, God told her to stay inside of her house. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere. Amen. Sometimes stay at home orders are ordained by God. Amen. Uh, you all didn't like that one. I'm just, just a joke. Just a joke. Uh, but she has stay at home orders. Amen. Governor DeWine told her to stay at home. Mess. We, we talk about uh, Rahab's life going from a mess to a miracle. And how there's still hope for anybody. Chapters 3 and 4 is the crossing of River Jordan. And we talk about that miracle of crossing River Jordan. We talk about the purpose of the miracle. Why God did it. God does miracles in your and I's life for a reason. He wants to show other people his power. And he also wants to show us his power. We talk about the requirements of the miracle, uh, what they had to do for, for the miracle to happen. They had to take a step in the, the brook, or in the flowing uh, Jordan. They had to take a step of faith. We talked about the, and then the testimony of the miracle, what they were supposed to do. They set up those 12 stones there uh, to testify what God did. You and I should have a testimony of the Lord what he's done. And you should have a place that you can go back to whenever you crossed over in full service for God and gave your life to him. Uh, then we talk chapter 5, the circumcision at Gilgal. Cutting away the flesh. The flesh had built up over many years living in Egypt. And we talk about how your flesh will build up just in your daily life. Uh, you don't have to beat yourself over the head all the time about, man, I'm still struggling with this or I'm still struggling with that. You're going to struggle with things because you're living in this world. It's going to build up. The flesh is going to build up just by living in the world. Uh, that you have to cut it away. Then we talk about the captain of the Lord's host in chapter 5, showing up to Joshua and how that was Jesus Christ uh, pre-incarnate. Chapter 6, the walls of Jericho fell down. And we talk about that, how that was a miracle in and of itself. Because all of God's people kept silent. Amen. And they kept silent. And they all, if you remember the illustration of Brother Jeff and Abby and Aiden walking around blowing their trumpets. Uh, Brother Jeff, I think, was uh, Joshua. Or it was Aiden. Aiden was Joshua. And Brother Jeff was blowing his, his trumpet. And uh, we talk about how it was a miracle that they all just did that. I mean, if your pastor came up to you and said, all right, folks, what we're going to do this morning is what I want. Brother Eugene, you start us out. And then Brother Kaisemore, you get behind, lying behind him, and he told each person where to go. And he said, all right, everybody, we're going to go outside. We're just going to march around the church. We're going to march around it. And Brother Jess is going to play his trumpet. And uh, we're all going to carry our, you know, our Colt 45s and our Rugers and our, and our Tauruses. And we're just going to walk around the building, and we're just going to blow that trumpet. And no one's going to say a word. We're just going to walk around. That would be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? <laughs> It would be really bad if the church fell down <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but anyway, that would be, be pretty wild. Well, Joshua had grown men do that, and they did it. And God blessed it. And sometimes God will ask you and I to do some weird or peculiar things, and he'll bless it. He'll bless it. That was chapter 6. Chapter 7, you have the defeated AI. We talk about the sins of covetousness, the sins of prayerlessness, and the sins of presumptuousness. Covetousness, well, I don't need to hit that one again. Prayerlessness. Joshua, one of his sins was that he would forget to pray sometimes, and he'd go make a big decision, and he'd make a blunder of it and hurt people with it. Presumptuous sin is a sin that where you go in and you think you can handle something without consulting God over it. That was chapter 7. Chapter 8, the conquest of Ai. God gave him another chance. Right after a failure in chapter 7, he gives him a victory in chapter 8. Joshua makes the same mistake in chapter 9, making a league with the Gibeonites. That was chapter 9, a league with the Gibeonites. He had friends with their own people, fellowship with their own people, and he did pray again whenever he went to make those uh, friendships. Um, and Joshua made a mistake. Just so you know, you will, you'll get victory over something after you made a mistake. You'll get victory, and then you'll make that same mistake again. It happens. It happens. What do you do? There's a chapter 10 coming along in your life. You've you got you to live out the next chapter of your life. You've got to keep going for God's what Joshua did. Chapter 10 is the victory at Gibeon. Uh, the sun stood still, the hailstones, and uh, we talk about that, how that's a great picture of what's going to happen in the tribulation with the hailstones coming down, the sun stood still, and that's a list of all the kings that uh, he conquered. Chapter 11 was that great battle at Lake Miram we talked about. Uh, chapter 12 was a list of all the kings conquered. We talked about co counting your blessings, counting your victories. You should keep a list of some victories in your life. Have them jotted down in the back of your Bible, things that you can go to. Uh, put it down by a verse in the Bible that blesses you and say, this is whenever I got victory over this, or this is that God helped me in this situation, or answer this prayer, counting your blessings in chapter 12. Chapter 13 starts out with Joshua is old and stricken in age. I love that verse, amen? God's a plain shooter. He doesn't beat around the bush. He didn't call him elderly. He didn't call him aged. He didn't call him wise. He said, Joshua, you're old and stricken in age. I mean, Joshua, you look old and beat up. Age is beating you up. Time is beating you up. That's what, he told, that's what he told him. He said he's stricken in age. We talk about how time can, can wear on you, can't it? Time can wear on you. And uh, 
We talk about uh, going on for the Lord. Joshua had to keep going on for the Lord. He wasn't done. Even though he's old and strict in age, God had something he wanted Joshua to do. Chapter 14, we compare Caleb and the Christian. Chapter 15, we talk about lots. Lots keep coming up all throughout the Bible, or all throughout Joshua. We talk about gambling with God, casting lots. We talk about what lots is. Chapter 16, we didn't cover the whole chapter, but we discussed in another lesson uh, about how they compromise. That's where you see the children of Israel compromising. They don't kill their enemies. They put them under tax, under levy. And say, even though God told us to destroy you, we're going to keep you around because we can make money off you. And, you know, we're not going to start living the way that you're living. We're just going to be close to you. We're going to work with you. We're going to have, you know, businesses with you. Uh, but we'll be all right. It's not going to drag us down. And it does drag them down. We talk about the results of compromising back in Joshua 23. But that was chapter 16. Chapter 17, feminine faith. Uh, the sons there, or the daughters there, we talk about having feminine faith and what those ladies' names meant. They went to Joshua and asked for something. They asked for their blessing. I believe in uh, women praying. I believe in women getting blessing from God. Um, and I, I just threw it out there with you. I believe God, God uses women throughout the Bible whenever the men aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. I have a woman at the hospital right now. I want you to pray for her name. I'll tell you her name later on uh, tonight. Uh, but she wants you to pray for her. Baptist lady. And, uh, she's not doing too good in the hospital. But uh, I prayed with her there Saturday after work. Um, but uh, long story short, she told me that she works with the homeless down in Florida. And she says that she preaches five days a week there to the homeless. And you say, well, Aaron, did you rebuke her for it? No, I love her. I love her. We need all the preachers we can get. You say, Aaron, it's supposed to be a man preaching. If the men aren't going to preach, let the women preach. Amen. 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 <laughs> just to get, you know, just to make some of you mad out there. Amen. If, if the men aren't going to preach, I was at a preacher's fellowship at uh, Sinking Spring over there a couple weeks ago. There was no preachers younger than 45, 50 years old there except for me. Men are going to preach. I say, have the women preach. Amen, brother. Amen. We don't believe in it. That's your prayer. Thank God we have men here that are willing to preach and teach. Amen. At this church. Amen. Uh, but anyways, uh, and uh, forgetful faith. We talk about that chapter eighteen. We talk about you're driving too slow. Amen. Uh, we talk about what are you asking for from God? Chapters nineteen through twenty. We did not cover. It was the, the dividing up of the lands. That was just a lot of reading. Um, and he, he's just dividing up the land. Chapter twenty one. The lessons from the Levites. We talk about qualifications for service. Chapter 22, we talked about misunderstanding. That was where the three tribes built that altar. We talked about how to handle misunderstandings. We talked about how your motives matter. And we talked about the more the merrier. Chapter 23, we talked about the blessings of being old. We talked about cleaving or compromising. And we talked about are you overworked or overflowing? Overworked or overflowing. Joshua gives them a good challenge in Joshua 23. Joshua got, he almost seems to get older the older. He, he, almost, he almost seems to get meaner the older he gets. Chapters 23 and 24 are pretty rough. And uh, and he, uh, he, he challenges them uh, to not cleave but to compromise to God. And then chapter 24 we talk about putting away your idols, how to put away your idols. We talk about American idols. Amen. That was a fun one. Wasn't well, it? Going through our idols in our life. That was fun. Well, Brother Jesse, I'm one smiling. Brother Eugene's got a half smile mm -hmm. on. But uh, putting away idols in your life. Amen. Uh, we talk about that in chapter 24. And then we talked last week about why Joshua served the Lord. Why Joshua served the Lord. There's all kinds of types of Jesus Christ throughout the book of Joshua. We won't cover those. I want to wrap up the book of Joshua uh, with this. Read these last few verses here with me. Joshua 24, verse 29. 24, verse 29. That's the overview of the book of Joshua, the, re the review of the book of Joshua. <clears throat> Look at the ending here. Uh, verse 29. It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnasera which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gaish. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, Joseph with the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem and parcel of ground, which Jacob brought, um, bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. Now, this book starts with a funeral and ends with funerals. It starts with the funeral of Moses and Joshua 1, and it ends with several funerals of Joshua. It talks about the funerals of all those that outlived Joshua and they died. It talks about Joseph's funeral. It talks about Eleazar's funeral. Uh, it starts with death and ends with death. Um, did you notice that Joshua followed the man Moses? But whenever Moses died, Joshua kept following God. Did you notice at the end of Joshua's life, as Joshua died and all the elders that were with him and the men that were working with him, once they died, you have the book of Judges come up. The children of Israel, see, they were following at that point Joshua. 
And once their leader was gone, once their spiritual mentor was gone, gone, their relationship with God was not strong enough for them to stay in. And I'll just say this quickly in wrapping up the book of Joshua. Folks, your spiritual relationship with God should go beyond Sunday morning in church and Sunday night in church. It should go beyond your pastor, your teacher, your heroes, your idols in the faith. Your relationship with God should last longer than whenever they're, whenever they're just there around. It should go on. You should have a walk with God that whenever that person's out of the picture, you're still able to go on and walk with God. Uh, notice something else there in verse 32. Uh, a dead man finally finds rest. In verse 32, a dead man finally gets to rest in peace. Joseph's bones are moved again, and now they're in their final resting place. Some of you, you feel tired and worn out in life. Could you imagine your bones getting moved all around? Even after you're, you're dead and gone, amen? I mean, no synovial fluid between your knee joints. They're just, they're just completely hit together, amen? The, it's just bones. And those poor bones, they can't rest. They can't find any rest. Now they're being moved again at the end of Joshua. They're being moved. Look over in Genesis chapter 33. I found this interesting. You know, I, was thinking, I was thinking, Lord, how to wrap up this book here, Joshua. Look at Genesis chapter 33. Verse number 18. Genesis 33, 18. Jacob came to Shalom, a city of Shechem. Does that word sound familiar? Joshua 24, I'll turn back. Joshua 24 says, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Stay there in Genesis 33. They're in Shechem whenever Joshua's talking. And then it says, the bones of Joseph, the children of Israel, brought up out of Egypt, and they buried them in Shechem. Jacob, in Genesis 33, verse 18, goes to Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. He went to Padam Aram and pitched his tent before the city. He bought a parcel of the field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elehul Israel. Uh, it just means God, the God of Israel. Now, look back, look, uh, turn up to Genesis chapter 50. He buys a piece of land. Turn back to Genesis chapter 50. This is at the end of Joseph's life. Joseph was Jacob's son. Keep that in mind. He's one of the 12 tribes. In Genesis chapter 50, look there in verse number 25. Joseph, Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him and put him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Uh, Genesis starts with the, in a garden, ends in a grave. Amen. First verse is God. The first verse is God's creating something. The last verse of Genesis, someone being put in a coffin. Uh, man always makes things go bad, doesn't he? Look at Exodus chapter thirteen. So this is fulfilled in Exodus thirteen. This, uh, Joseph said, hey, "You're going to take my bones and get them up out of Egypt one day," and the promise is fulfilled. Exodus thirteen verse nineteen. Moses, who's a picture of the law took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and he shall carry up my bones away from hence. So Moses, a picture of the law, was able to bring the dead out of Egypt. But it wasn't until Joshua, a type of Christ, came in that the dead man was able to finally find rest and peace forever. Moses, the type of the law, was able to help that dead man in Egypt, that lost man in Egypt, that dead man Joseph who was buried in Egypt. He was able to bring him out of Egypt to Moses, the type of the law. But it wasn't until Joshua, a type of Christ, would came by where that dead man was finally able, he was able to find forever peace. His bones are finally settled. And you say, Aaron, I'm not following you. Romans 6 says, uh, you don't have to turn there uh, unless you want to. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, like Joseph was dead? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, death, like Joshua, or, uh, and Joseph. In the likeness of death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the dead man is crucified with him. That the body of sin should not be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye, sell, ye, ye yourselves also to be dead indeed, like Joseph was, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for not in the law, but under grace. You say, well, what are you getting at? You know, you and I are dead men. 
Amen. You say, this is confusing because I thought we're alive in Christ. Well, in Christ we are alive, but our old man is dead. The old man is crucified. But we're also alive. We say, what are you talking about? I'm saying the day that you got saved and born again, you, you, you have the capacity now, you have the ability now through Joshua, through Jesus Christ, through the uh, Jesus Christ, you have the ability as a dead man to finally rest in peace. You can put that dead man to sleep and say, dead man, you can go ahead and just enjoy yourself now. You're dead. You're no longer alive. You know what? At the end of Joshua, at the end of this book of Joshua, you know what finally happens? A dead man is finally able to have some rest. They say rest in peace. Well, this dead man, Joseph, who died back in Genesis 50, years later, he's able to find rest whenever Joshua, type of Jesus Christ, comes into the picture. Between Genesis chapter 50, when Joseph prophesies that God will bring out his bones out of Egypt, and Exodus chapter 13, when our Moses takes the bones out of Egypt, is around 200 years. It may take some time, but every promise of God will come true. Amen. Amen. Joseph said that in Genesis 50. He said, I believe that God's going to do this in my life. I believe God's going to do this for me. Eventually, God's going to do this. And it took 200 years, and finally, God's word was fulfilled on the dime. So it may take time, but God's word will come to pass. Between Genesis 33, though, Genesis 33, remember where Jacob bought that piece of land? Between Genesis 33 and Joshua 24, there's nearly 300 years that pass. And you don't turn back there, but in Genesis 33, just so you know, whenever Jacob bought that piece of land in Shechem, did you know he was out of God's will whenever he did that? I didn't know this. I was looking it up. I, I didn't know why he was out of God's will. I had to read the whole story. Um, Jacob, remember in, in Genesis chapter 33, if you don't remember, Jacob and Esau make amends with each other. Remember that story of Jacob and Esau? They finally meet up and they say, hey, I'm not mad at you anymore. I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. And they make amends. What happens is they split up. And Jacob goes to Shechem and buys a piece of land. Do you know where Jacob was supposed to go? God told him in Genesis 31 where to go. To Bethel. Jacob, now follow me, I'm going somewhere with this. Jacob was supposed to go back to Bethel, but instead he disobeyed God again. He went and lived outside of the city because Jacob's a conniver. He's a moneymaker. He's a schemer. He's going to do whatever makes Jacob the most money. So he goes outside the city of Shechem, makes some land, takes all of his crop, all of his uh, family there and all of his uh, animals there. He goes outside the city of Shechem, buys the land, and he's out of the will of God. You know what happens in Genesis 34, the very next chapter? His daughter gets raped by the people of that land. And his two sons, Simeon and Levi, go and they trick those men and they say, circumcise yourselves and we'll just make, we'll make marriages with you. You make marriages with our sons and daughters and we'll make a league together. And they betray the citizens of that land and they end up going in and killing all of them. Because of that, uh, Jacob curses those two men and their families, Simeon and Levi. We talked about that before. He curses those two. So now Jacob has family problems. His daughter got raped. And his sons have went and made war with the enemies. Now Jacob's worried about all of his enemies coming to fight him. And on top of that, there's, there's dysfunction in his family. Because of a wrong decision that Jacob made. Because of a wrong decision that Jacob made. You said, Aaron, all that's in your Bible? Yeah, all that's in the Bible. You don't need a soap opera, amen. Read your Bible. There's plenty of stories in there. Yeah. <laughs> so Jacob's out of the will of God. Again, he acts in the flesh, makes a mistake, chooses a city uh, uh, and that's material goods, and he's conniving once again. And because of that, he pays a price. So what I'm getting at is that Jacob made a stake in Genesis 31 by buying the field in Shechem. You say, why is this important? Because even though Jacob made a mistake and had to pay for it, nearly 300 years down the road, God's going to bless one of Jacob's sons through his mistake. Joseph was Jacob's son. You know the final place that Joseph goes to to rest his bones is in the father or in the field of Shechem? That his father bought whenever he died the will of God. You say, Aaron, what are you saying? At the end of the book of Joshua, you know what we find out? That all things work together for good to them that love God. Jacob, man, I know we're talking about Jacob. Jacob made mistake after mistake after mistake. He was selfish. He was conniving. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was carnal. But he, throughout his life, he did love God. You know what God said? He said, Jacob, you don't know anything about this. You don't even, I'm not going to tell you about it, Jacob, while you're alive. 
But 300 years down the road in Joshua 24, uh, the children of Israel, they're going to take your son Joseph's bones and they're going to lay them to rest there in the field of Shechem. It's an inheritance to them. You say, what are you talking about? I'm saying that you and I, folks, you may make mistakes. You may get out of the will of God. You may make decisions that are wrong. You may say, I mean, you may beat yourself over the head and say, man, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have went there. I shouldn't have bought that. I shouldn't have made those decisions. And you may have to pay for them. But in the end, you know what we find out? All things work together for good. All things. All things. Folks, it doesn't matter how bad you're hurting. It doesn't matter how bad you messed up. It doesn't matter how much you will mess up. It doesn't matter how much you'll do wrong. It doesn't matter. I'm not telling you to go and live wicked. I'm not telling you to go and live any way you want to. But I'm telling you this. We find a promise at the end of the book of Joshua that it doesn't matter. All things truly work together for good for them that love God. In the, the book of Joshua, we find that out. Aren't you glad God's in control? Amen. You say, I don't believe that was the main purpose of the book of Joshua. I don't believe it is either, but I think it's a good way to wrap it up. Don't you? I hope, folks, that the lessons helped you. I hope it's helped you to realize that God has a lot for you and I. He has a lot for us to have in our lives. He has an inheritance for us. He has battles for us. He has wars for us to fight. Uh, but, folks, I, I thank God that you and I can be successful saints in God's eyes. Amen. We can be conquering Christians. We can defeat the foe. And we can win. And at the end of it all, they got their world back then. They got their villages and towns. Amen. We'll get ours later. We're just investing in the future. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we do love you. And we thank God for loving us. Thank you for being good to us, God. And, uh, Lord, I pray that your children are able to glean things from the book of Joshua. Uh, God, they were able to get something, Lord, to help them out. Lord, I pray that your book, Lord, would stick inside of their hearts and the lessons, Lord. And although we may not think of them all the time, God, I know that they're in there, Lord. They're inside of our hearts for you to pull out whenever you have, have us to uh, remember them, God. And, uh, Lord, I pray you help each person in here, Lord, to realize that all things do work together for good. Uh, God, help us, Lord, have a walk with you and a relationship with you, God, like Joshua had. That Whether we mess up, whether our hero Moses dies, whether uh, uh, the brethren mess up, God, or there's a misunderstanding, whatever it is, God, if there's walls that have to come down, whatever it is, God, Lord, you're able. Uh, you're able, Lord, to help us through it, God. I pray, Lord, you be with us the rest of the morning service. God, I pray you bless the pastor in a special way, God. We didn't miss him whenever he's gone. And, God, I pray that he'd have a word from you. I got that his cup will be overflowing, Lord, and we'd be able, Lord, to get some of ours, Lord, this morning. I pray that you'd be pleased with all said and done. We owe it all to Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and amen.